Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome so many people here today at our next symposium, Democracy Today in the USA. On the 4th of March, 1801, it was President Thomas Jefferson who in his first inaugural address expressed his conviction that America is, quote unquote, the world's best hope. And in 1862, it was President Lincoln who reminded Congress that America is, again, quote unquote, the last best hope of Earth. Just two decades later, the millions and millions who immigrated to America, they all would pass the Statue of Liberty. With on its pedestal, the immortal words of Emma Lazarus, a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Moral of Exiles. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, she cries with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor. Send these, the homeless, tempest toast to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Now, welcomed by these words on the Statue of Liberty, for all those millions, just like Leverson and, and Lincoln, America represented the last best hope on Earth. Why? Because America is a democracy. And this word became a shibboleth for a whole idea of civilization. Democracy meant for all of them liberty, equal rights, the rule of law, separation of powers, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, a world of reason, the pursuit of happiness. When in the 20th century, the old world, our world, came in the grip of a self-inflicted totalitarianism. As we should never forget that Mussolini, Hitler, Lenin and Stalin were all welcomed by millions. For other millions, in particular Jews, anti-fascist, artists, intellectuals, America again proved to be the last best hope on Earth. One of those who found refugees in America was the novelist and Nobel Prize winner Thomas Mann, who not long after his arrival in 1938 went on a coast-to-coast -coast town hall lecture series on, entitled the coming, the coming Victory of Democracy. Now here is what Mann says at the end of his lecture in 1938. I quote, Four years ago, I visited America for the first time, and since then I've come here each year. I was delighted with the atmosphere that I found here because it was almost free of the poison that filled the air of Europe. Because here, in contrast to the cultural fatigue and inclination to barbarism in the old world, there exists a youthful respect for culture, a youthful sensitivity to its values and its products. I believe that for the duration of the present European dark age, the center of Western civilization will shift to America. America has received much from Europe, and that debt will be amply repaid if, by saving our traditional values from the present gloom, she can preserve for them a brighter future that will once again find Europe and America united in the great tasks of humanity. After the Second World War, with America as superpower, democracy and America became synonyms. Synonyms for the free and civilized world. And that part of the world where there is no democracy, well, there is no freedom that's not civilized, and therefore the whole world should be made safe for and through democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nexus Institute has chosen to organize today's symposium, Democracy Today in the USA, as we are convinced that Alexis de Tocqueville, what Alexis de Tocqueville said in his magnificent book, Democracy in America, is still very true. To have an understanding of Americans' democracy will help us, Europeans, to understand what we have to hope for or fear from. And when American democracy is in trouble, then that will affect something much larger than the world as it is nowadays. Because it will have a tremendous effect on our worldview. It does affect our notion of what a civilized world is supposed to be. Okay, I'm very pleased 
that an all-star American team accepted my invitation <coughs> to come to Amsterdam to engage in a conversation about issues and questions uh, which will not only determine the future of America, but will have a huge impact on European society as well. So please join me in a very warm welcome to Anne Applebaum. <laughs> Sean Willens. <laughs> Roger Bergovic. <laughs> Ambassador Derek Shearer. Yeah. And Randall Kennedy. Now, unfortunately, and very much to our regret, due to family circumstances, um, our dear friend Asa Navisi could not make it. But Jeb Bush is here. <laughs> and we are very proud of having him and honored that he has chosen the Nexus Symposium to present his views uh, and discuss with our other guest, Democracy Today in the USA. So, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> a heartfelt welcome to Governor Jeb Bush. Thank you, Rob. Good afternoon. It is a joy to be here. Um, I've heard so much about the Nexus Institute and um, the thoughtful conversation that we're going to have for the next three hours. Uh, and uh, the fact that you all are here to, to hear about something that is very important. I'm with five incredible scholars and a former politician. Hopefully we'll, we'll all learn together about the challenges of democracy in our country and the impact that might have here in Europe as well. Um, we share a common culture. Uh, we share a lot. And I think our political systems also um, are being impacted in similar ways. In retrospect, I was a candidate, you may know, uh, I didn't, wasn't there long enough. You might not have noticed the, the campaign, but uh, it's, it was actually 13, 14 months, and during that time, I learned a lot. I did share, I listened to the frustrations of a lot of people that were concerned that our system wasn't working, that our democracy really wasn't working, that our government wasn't working. Uh, in our country, a country where Europeans not that long ago would, would uh, constantly say, you Yanks are way overly optimistic about things, naively optimistic. No one, no one can say that anymore about America. Uh, for the last, literally for the last decade, Americans, when asked in polls, will say that we're on the wrong track. And they're deeply pessimistic about the future. For the first time in American history, people believe their children will have less opportunities than what they had. And in that environment, uh, it was, it's not surprising to see the disruption of the political system. In fact, I would argue, and that's the point of uh, my brief remarks here today, that this has all been happening, perhaps in increments not discernible to the naked eye, for an extended period of time. The financial crisis makes all of this kind of cascade out into the public domain, and the changing culture and many other things now uh, has changed our political system. And I wanted to give you my views about why this is, uh, because there are some rational things that have been taken place where we haven't made adjustments. First, we are living through one of the most extraordinary times in world history where the advancement of technology and innovation is extraordinary. I mean, we're moving at warp speed with the changes that are taking place, and the institutions that we've relied on to allow to provide some security and stability in our lives have, have stopped to work to the degree that they used to work. Now, technology and advancement and innovation is phenomenal if you're educated, if you're motivated, if you have a support mechanism around you, you can embrace that technology and live a life of purpose and meaning that, that uh, is awe-inspiring. In fact, I would say it's probably the best time to be alive. Babies brought into the world today that have loving families, that, that have resources, will live easily till they're 120, 130 years old. They'll live healthier. I'm not sure exactly what the world looks like 100 years from now, but it is uh, because of technology and innovation that you can dream the biggest possible dreams. 
On the other side of this, though, technology has created massive disruption. Think about Facebook. Facebook has a market capitalization, a value that is, on a net present value basis, I think greater than General Motors at the height of its power. General Motors at the height of its power had 300,000 employees. Facebook, I think, probably has 4,000 employees. You see the aggregation, accumulation of wealth in ways that no one could have imagined, and the, the innovation that's taking place isn't kind of creating the jobs that we would expect in, uh, in, in, in the world that we've, that we've gotten accustomed to. So innovation can be your friend, but it also can be a disruptor, and there's a lot of disruption going on in America today. Last year, McKinsey did a study that showed that half of the jobs in the United States could be disrupted because of automation. Babies brought into the world today, perhaps in Amsterdam, but certainly in the United States, if you're, if you're born into poverty, the possibility is that you'll never have a job. So imagine if you're a voter and you're looking at all this disruption and you see your life change and you don't see the systems that were there to take that you know, provide security and, uh, and opportunity for you. They don't, they don't sense that, you don't sense that they're working. You have a financial crisis. It's not a surprise that we have uh, what is clearly a pretty wild and, and crazy uh, a political system that's, that's uh, because of that. The second issue that I think is a trend that's been taking place for more than a generation is globalization. Again, globalization has brought huge benefits to the United States in terms of lower consumer prices, new markets, uh, people being lifted out of poverty that creates uh, great potential for our country. But globalization also means when you lag behind, when you don't modernize your regulatory system, when your education system operates as though it was in 1950, where higher education operates with the same model that applied 100 years ago, and you see the challenges that take place, you don't have the benefit in a, in, a, in a globalized world where money can, is fungible, where you, you'll see investment patterns move to what the best climate is, we lose our competitive edge and it, it creates greater, imperils more and more people. And so again, once again, a trend that is a secular trend that has nothing to do with American politics has created strains on our democracy that, that the political system hasn't, hasn't uh, dealt with. The third secular trend that is pretty dramatic, and it's certainly uh, dramatic in Europe and equally dramatic in the United States, is that our demographics have changed dramatically. My plan, by the way, for everybody in this room 10 years from now is that you're going to be 10 years older. Anybody uh, argue with that? Well, the simple fact is we're getting older together, and that dramatically changes a lot. The social contract that uh, existed in Europe certainly, and again in the United States, is being torn apart by changing demographic changes. Our, our demographic pyramid is inverted, and the political system seems unable or incapable to be able to confront that great challenge, and people are scared about their future. Recently, there was a, a poll done uh, by Money Magazine that suggests that 63% of Americans cannot afford a $500 car repair. 70% of Americans cannot have a crisis that would cost $1,000 or more. They don't have liquid assets to be able to deal with a crisis. If you don't think that impacts the political system, where the anxiety that people feel about their future, where one car wreck or one, one, uh, one visit to the emergency room will change your life and change your family's life, trust me, it does. And so in that, in that period, this time of deep anxiety, partially related to the fact of our inability to, to change the social contract to deal with the reality of our changing demographics, um, you're, people are fearful. I'm, a, I'm the chairman of a foundation for education reform, K-12 education reform in the United States, and hopefully we'll talk about that today as one of the means by which we, we change, we get back in the game as it relates to making our democracy vibrant. But we, we created a dependency ratio if you take people under the age of 18 and you add up the people over the age of 65 and you divide it to the rest of the people, that's the dependency ratio. And that dependency ratio in 2010 was 59. By 2030, that'll be 79. In Florida, in Arizona, Nevada, three of the fastest growing states in the United States, that number will be 90. 
And in Florida, which had the oldest dependency ratio and the highest dependency ratio in 2010, by 2030, every state in the country will have a higher dependency ratio than, than Florida's of 2010. The world is changing, and yet our political system and our governance model has, seems ill-equipped to be able to deal with it. In fact, I would argue immigration should be a solution to some of the challenges that we face, when in fact it's now a, a political wedge issue that uh, it's like, it's like um, uh, it never ends. It's just every cycle, both sides use it as a wedge issue to garner political votes rather than taking advantage of this extraordinary American experience of immigration. It now is, is stuck in... Uh, uh, you know, Groundhog's Day, it just never goes away and we're not taking advantage of the potential to solve these problems. The fourth big secular change that's taking place in our country is our culture is changing. My party talks with great, uh, you know, with, speaks a lot about Ronald Reagan. Well, he was a great president. I loved Ronald Reagan and my dad got to serve eight years as his vice president and he changed the world in many ways. But that was a long time ago. And our culture is dramatically different today. And the, the, the need to be able to update one's message to talk about the challenges that we face today, seems, it, it, it seems hard to do. And one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in is our culture has changed. Today in the United States, 42% of the babies brought in the world will have a dad, obviously, but that dad won't be the husband of mom. And a quarter of all children will grow up not knowing who their father is. This is an experiment that has never taken place in, in modern history. And the strains that this is now placing on our system is dramatic. And yet, and that's a cultural change that uh, uh, hasn't, hasn't been dealt with in my, in my mind. We have uh, social and economic mobility now that has stalled out. America was always proud of the fact that it didn't matter where you started in life, if you worked hard and played by the rules, you could be born in poverty and achieve great things. Well, today, if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay poor than any time in, in modern history. And if you're born wealthy, you're hanging out with people of wealth, you're living in the zip codes where wealthy people hang out, you go to the best schools, uh, and you're gonna live a life of extraordinary purpose and meaning. And that lack of mobility is one of the reasons why we have a strain in our democracy. And the inability to deal with these great challenges, I think, makes it easy and easier in retrospect to see on the left a candidate like Bernie Sanders, and certainly in my party, uh, the emergence of Donald Trump, becomes, becomes easier perhaps to understand. So what should we do? First and foremost, I hope we get to the point where as Americans, whether you're a liberal or a conservative or a libertarian or a socialist now, I guess we have, uh, that you believe that high sustained economic growth has to be part of the answer. We're accepting the new normal, this terminology that I find repugnant, of 2% growth, 1.5% growth. 1.5% or 2% growth will create demands on government that will overwhelm us, will make it harder for people to be optimistic about the future. Where people, more and more people will will be given the false choice of what they perceive to be economic security rather than economic opportunity. And the dynamism of our country will continue to decline at a time when we need to be significantly more dynamic. Higher income by itself, higher growth is by itself won't, uh, isn't the, all the answer, but without it, it creates uh, very limited possibilities. And we could, we could grow, given the nature of our country, given the size, its scale, the fact that we um, uh, have the potential uh, inside of us, we're still dynamic in many ways, we could grow at 2% more. To put it in perspective, 2% growth compounded out for 10 years would create a Germany of additional economic activity, something like $4 trillion of additional economic activity in the 10th year alone. It would create rising income instead of declining income, and my guess is that it would dramatically change how we go about uh, viewing our politics. If people are more hopeful and optimistic, they won't fall prey to the false promise. They won't fall prey to the large, you know, the, 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 the big horse in the room that is offering all sorts of promises that, that aren't backed by substance. And so economic growth has to be part of this. The second thing that I think is essential, and again, uh, I don't believe this is necessarily a partisan issue as well, are what are the tools that people need to be able to rise up again? How do we deal with this great challenge of people feeling like their lives have been stalled out? 
I don't think the issue is, when we'll talk about this, income inequality. I think the issue is the lack of social and economic mobility. And there are certain things that really matter as it relates to the, the chance for people to rise up. The most important one of which is to move our K-12 or K-forever education system, make it lifelong, and move it to the 21st century. Transform our education system so that more and more people have the power of knowledge. The tools that come from a quality education will allow people to be on the good side of innovation and change rather than be in a, overwhelmed by it in terms of the disruption that it brings. And we've got a long way to go, starting with pre-K all the way through our higher education system. It has not been challenged to the degree it has to. I can envision an education system 20 years from now where every child has the ability to reach their God-given ability, where they gain the skills necessary to be, to be uh, effective in life, and where they can always go back to, to adjust their education based on the circumstances in which they're living, where everybody learns in their own way at their own pace, rather than having little butts in a seat when you're young, be funded by 180 days of, of breathing, basically, where instead of that, you have an education system where you maximize people's ability to learn and where people that, young, young people that can learn faster will graduate quicker with the skills necessary to go get a post-secondary degree. And for those that are struggling, they get the help necessary to achieve their objective without being uh, cast behind. Today in America, this is hard for people to imagine, at least uh, in our country, about a third of our children graduate from high school, career or college ready. We have an 80% high school graduation rate and everybody applauds it when it goes up a percentage point each year, something like that. But half of, those, half of those kids have to take remedial work again. They go to a community college, take high school reading and high school math again. And if you want to measure career readiness, we've got a long way to go to match the European example of having young people that don't necessarily go to um, universities or community colleges to be able to apply whatever they've learned to be able to get a meaningful job. I think we need a revolution in education first and foremost, and I think our political system will be far better off if we had people that were, were, had the capacity to achieve earned success. It changes your dynamic if you're optimistic about the future because you believe in your own skills. And now, sadly, more and more people don't believe that the, the system works for them. The final thing I'd suggest is that we need to make government work, and that's not a partisan issue as well. I mean, if you believe in larger government, you want it to work. If you believe in smaller government, like I do, you want it to work. We have a Veterans Administration, for example, that has 360,000 employees. It's a lot of people. They've had increases in their budget that have been in the tens of billions of dollars over the last decade of time. Yet, if you look at how ineffective they are for doing what I would consider perhaps the highest priority, one of the highest priorities of government, which is to take care of people that have kept our country safe, no one could argue that they're doing their job right. Last year, the Veterans Administration, to put, it, put a specific to, to, the, to the challenge that we face, gave out bonuses of $140 million. And in that bonus structure, they gave bonuses to managers of the, inside the Veterans Administration, the largest healthcare system in the world, uh, they gave out bonuses for people getting off waiting lists, for veterans that weren't getting care. Well, here's the problem. They were getting off the waiting list. People were getting off the waiting list, but not receiving the care, and veterans died, and bonuses went out. And after the scandal, only three people have been fired. Now, whether you're a liberal or a conservative, that's outrageous, that's shameful, and we need to change how government works. If our democracy is to work, it seems to me our government needs to be much more servant-oriented, if you will, and much more effective. And I think there are tools that we have in place today to bring our government into the 21st century, and there are many examples of success stories in that regard. The final thing I'll say is a, a point that I hope we talk about a little bit, which is in the United States, people look at the political system uh, and they, they think of it as a foreign object. They really do. I mean, they talk about politics and government as though it's something removed from their lives. And that makes it harder to change our political system and to restore our democracy if people are disengaged from it. In fact, politics is a mirror image of us. Just as it is here 
in the Netherlands. It's certainly that way in the United States. It is, it is a circus mirror, if you will, of our culture. And we have to be engaged in changing it. Arthur Brooks is the uh, CEO, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, which is one of the leading think tanks in Washington, D.C., a, a, a center-right think tank. And he's a good friend, a wonderful guy. He has befriended the Dalai Lama, which I find is a fairly unusual uh, odd couple, this intele conservative intellectual and, and his holiness. Uh, and at one of their, their last conference, the Dalai Lama shows up with all these big dog donors to the... To, the, to this uh, uh, prestigious think tank, and he goes, Arthur says to the Dalai Lama, didn't say, what's the meaning of life? That would have been my first question. He, he asks, how do we change our, 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 the political climate? And the Dalai Lama had observations that I think are really true. He says the solution doesn't start with institutions, it starts with people. That if you think about it in that way, then we have a responsibility to change who we are. And in politics, that means that the first impulse shouldn't be to demonize someone that disagrees with you. Because that's what's happening right now in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. particularly, maybe not in all state capitals, Republicans don't even interact with Democrats anymore, and Democrats obviously don't interact with Republicans. It's very easy to demonize someone if you don't even know who they are. Now, I have liberal friends, and hopefully liberals have conservative friends in our real lives. That's kind of what we do. We still interact with one another. In Washington, we should have that same attitude that just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that they're a bad person. If you start with that premise, it's amazing how the culture could change. And hopefully the next president of the United States will make this one of their higher priorities is to change that climate. And the second thing he said that I, I consider to be extraordinarily important this time where toughness and strength is measured by vulgarity and the volume of your voice in American political life, what he said is that people need to be warm-hearted again, that they, they should have a heart for people, that the first impulse is to have concern for somebody rather than to, you know, to promote yourself. If we were warm-hearted as a people, my guess is our political system would look dramatically different. And politicians that would prey on people's angst and their fears would not gain the kind of support that it appears, at least temporarily, that they're gaining in the United States today. If we're serious about restoring democracy, which I think and I hope you all consider to be an important priority for the world and certainly for our own country for the sake of my grandchildren and everybody's grandchildren and children, this is a hugely important deal. We have to be warm-hearted again. Thank you all very much. <laughs>